Praise the Lord, everybody. A little, just a couple of verses past the, the usual suspects in Acts chapter 2, certainly on Pentecost Sunday, when they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance, the Bible says, verse 7, that they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? They began to, to read off all the places where they were from. And they said, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So plain and simple, we, we, we find out there in the scripture that when they were speaking in a language that they did not understand, they were worshiping God. Now, you read a little bit later in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes and says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, 
but my understanding is unfruitful. He says, I don't know what I'm praying when I pray in the Holy Ghost. So then he says, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. What does that mean for you and I tonight? If you're praying in the Holy Ghost, then you know you're praising God. If you're praying in English tonight, then why don't you begin to lift up some words of praise, some words of worship. Let's give God some glory with understanding. Let's lift up the name of Jesus and give him praise in his house.
your people sign Rejoice in the Lord your God Surely the Lord is doing God, praise God. Amen. There's a law of physics. I guess you'd call it the law of gravity. Because whatever goes up will come right back down. It just happens. You push something up by force, when it runs out of that force, it's going to come right back down to this earth. What happens when we pray? The Bible says that it reaches up into the heavens and it stays there. But it makes it into heaven. There is one scripture that says the Lord can open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that we're not even able to contain. I would to God, we, we'd send up some praise tonight. We'd send up some, some glory unto the Lord tonight. And he just might open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings into the house of God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want the windows of heaven open. I don't want the prayers of the saints just to be shut up there, but I want it to cause the windows to burst open and blessings to be poured out. Amen. And I'm not talking about money in the bank and a new car in the driveway. I'm talking about souls being saved, chains being broken, and, and troubled minds having peace and and broken bodies being healed. I want the windows of heaven to be open tonight. Amen. Do you believe that it'll do it? I mean, it don't take but two or three to agree for God to begin to work. Amen. I want to see the Lord move tonight. Amen. So glad that you're in the house of the Lord. So glad that you're here on this Sunday night, on this Pentecost Sunday night. Amen. I wouldn't want to be caught outside of church tonight. Amen. I want to be in the house of the Lord this evening. Amen. Good to have you here in God's house. If anybody on my right side have a spoken prayer request.
Praise God. Amen. It don't matter what was wrong. If God touches you, everything's all right. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm on my left. platform Amen. I like it when God answers fast. And we had that phone call the other day, and I don't even remember what I had to go and do. I had to drive into town. I was just in the truck. I said, Lord, I just need you to move in this situation. I just, I don't want to have to fight. I don't want to have to deal with this. I got back home, walked in the door, and the phone rang. And she said, I've got good news for you. Said, We've decided to accept full responsibility. And I'm just, I'm just thankful that he took the load off my mind. Amen. God's good. I mean, everything don't always work out the way we think it should, but I'm just glad whenever I know for a fact that God moved for us and when God moved for you. Amen. Let's take all these needs before the Lord by faith right now.
Amen. We want the ushers to come, give you the opportunity to give and your tithe and your offering. Amen. Are you tired of Acts chapter 2 yet? The apostle Peter was preaching to them. He, he was going and going and going. I know we read it pretty quick. Maybe he filled in the blanks. I don't know. But he was preaching to them. But there was not a response that's recorded until he said one thing to them. He said, you need to know that that Jesus whom you crucified is now both Lord and Christ. It was the understanding that the man Jesus was their God come as their Savior that caused them to respond in faith and say, I want to know what to do. Are you thankful that you know who Jesus is? Are you thankful that you know that he came and he died for your sins so that you can lift up your hands in this place tonight and feel his presence? Can we lift up that name? Can we lift up the word in the name of Jesus?
Give the Lord some praise here in the house of God tonight. Oh, come on. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. For His mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hey, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Aren't you glad that this is that which was spoken up by the prophet John? In the last day, saith God, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all. Somebody ought to shout all. All flesh. Aren't you glad that you're a part of that tonight? I'm glad today to be a part of the apostolic church. I'm glad today to be filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues. Aren't you glad today? Oh, this is that which was spoken of. Oh, over 2,000 years ago, the prophet Joel gave a word of prophecy that the Holy Ghost would be poured out. And Peter, on the day of Pentecost, he preached that message. He said, these men are not drunken as you suppose, but this is that. And we love, we absolutely love that Scripture. This is not what I'm going to preach tonight, but, but, but he started kind of midway through that prophecy. Because the Bible said in the 23rd verse of that chapter, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down to you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed, and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Now, I, I want you to catch something. In the 1800s, before the turning of the century, Israel, the land of Israel, was a wasteland. Nothing grew there. It was a desert place. You remember in the Bible, when God sent them to Israel, He said, I'm sending you to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. 
They found their grape cluster so big that they had to be carried between two men. It was a place of vineyards they didn't plant. It was a place of houses they didn't build. But because they failed to live up to God's standard, the land was cursed. What God said in the last days, I'm going to cause everything everything that you've lost is going to be restored just about the time of the Azusa Street Revival there fell the latter rain for the first time in over 2,000 years and now if you go to Israel it's full of olive yards, it's full of vineyards it's one of the most wealthy places for crops in all of the world because the word of God has come to pass he's blessing the people of Israel again And then he said, in the last days after this, I'll pour out my spirit. Oh, don't you know today that it's the greatest outpouring of the Holy Ghost the world has ever seen. On the day of Pentecost in A.D. 30 when the Holy Ghost fell the first time, 3,000 souls were added to the church. But I want you to know that today on this planet, every 16 seconds on this day of Pentecost, somebody is being filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Come on, I wish somebody would do some math for me right now. Oh, right now somebody's getting filled. Somebody's getting baptized. Why? The Lord is restoring the years that have been lost. Uh Uh, This ain't my message, but let's just stay here for a little while. It's all right. A study was done a few years ago that for the first time in American history since they started tracking these things, regular church attendance has fell below 50%. For the average American, for the first time in our history, 47% of people say, of American people say that they are members of a church. And after COVID, only 38% of those people that were a member of of a church has gone back to church. That means for the average 100, uh, 100 person church, only 38 of those people have decided when the church reopened its doors, they're going to go back to church. Church membership and religion is declining in our nation. But can I tell you today that the, the, the greatest growing movement of this hour is not the Baptist, it's not the Catholic, it's not Islam, it's none of those things, but the fastest growing movement is this apostolic Pentecostal church. Why is that? Because God promised in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Come on, we ought to be able to get excited about that right now. Come on, we're not some backwood on the other side of the track, Mill Village Church. We're we're a part of the greatest thing going. We're a part of the apostolic, Jesus' name, tongue talking, signs and wonders following, Church of the Living God. Pastor in Memphis, Tennessee, he said, he said, you know, we these churches that have closed their doors and they they have social distance and they don't they haven't opened up the doors. Said we had a lady that left Walmart, a sinner lady left Walmart one night on getting her groceries and drove by the church and saw the parking lot filled and wondered what's going on in that church over there. So she decided to pull up in the church. Decided to pull up in the church and see what's going on in this church's parking lot is full. And before she left, sitting on the back pew, she was speaking in tongues as God gave her the utterance. I'm here to tell you that this thing's still real. God's still filling with the Holy Ghost. God's still saving people. People are still getting baptized. They're coming in droves. They want to be a part of this thing. They want something that's real. They want something that's genuine. They want something they can feel. They're hungry after God. They're hungry for the things of God. They're hungry for something that will satisfy their soul. Aren't you glad to be a part of the best thing going? (laughs) 
about 1,500 years ago. See, the prophet, no, the prophet, not right, rather the prophet, the apostle John, when he wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, it's believed by many scholars that that is the same John, the revelator, that was on Patmos when God said, write the letters to the churches. Write the letters to the seven churches. But it's believed by scholars it's the same John who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the, the letters to the churches, and he began to warn them of, of things that were going to be coming, doctrines that are going to be coming, Gnosticism and doctrines of, of Trinity and the things that they did not preach to them that will be coming into the church. And about 1,500, 1,600 years ago, give or take a few, the church that the apostles started and that Jesus Christ founded on, on the rock of the message of Peter, the apostle on the day of Pentecost, that church began to go in different directions as they allowed the world into the church. Mm -hmm, somebody ought to say amen. You know, bad things happen when you let the world into the church. And they begin to marry paganism with their Christian religion. And, and all of a sudden, we've got millions of people today that have been baptized the wrong way. They think they got the Holy Ghost, and all they've really got is confess naming and confessing. And we've got a whole world that's on their way to hell, and they don't even realize it. Why? Because somebody decided to marry the world with the church. But can I tell you today, that right now in this world, there are Baptist pastors that are coming to the knowledge of the oneness of God. There's Catholic preachers that are coming to the knowledge of the oneness of God. There's Muslim imams that are having visions of Jesus Christ and are going, oh, oh, our pastor friend in Lebanon right now is receiving people in this church that are saying, I'm a Muslim, but I saw a vision of Jesus that sent me to this address. Can I tell you, he's restoring the years, everything that was lost because of men that brought in an ungodly doctrine. God's restoring that today. Oh, I wish I'd have somebody help me today. Hey! He was restoring all the years that have been lost. He's restoring the original church. He's rebuilding the doctrine. He's rebuilding the apostolic message. People are getting baptized in Jesus' name. Not just overseas, but here as well. Churches are being rebaptized. Pastors are beginning to preach the oneness. Why? Because they're seeing the message. They're seeing the revelation of the mighty God in Christ. And that's something to be excited about. All right? Amen, amen, amen. I don't even know how to get started. Proverbs 27, 7. One, one verse of Scripture tonight. All kinds of confirmation. All kinds of confirmation. Just wish there was a better preacher to give it to you. Proverbs 27, 7. What does the Bible say? It said, The full soul loatheth a honeycomb. But to the... Come on, help, help me out. But to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Why don't you put your Bible down and lift up your hands and your voices to Him right now? Come on, are you hungry for God? Come on, there's a hunger that's in the world. Is it in you today? Oh, God, we're hungry for you. We're hungry for signs and demonstration. We're hungry for an outpouring of your Spirit. We're hungry for revival. We're hungry for whatever you want to do in our church in this hour. We're hungry for it. The hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. I bless you. Be seated. I am a fan of the Andy Griffith show. That's not usually how you start a sermon, is it? I am a fan of the Andy Griffith show. Black and white, in color. Doesn't matter to me, I like them all. I like them all. And my favorite episode is entitled Dinner at Eight. Some of you know what I'm talking about already. For those of you who don't know, Opie and Aunt B have decided that they're going to be gone for a few days, leaving Andy alone at the house. And Andy is looking forward to having some time alone. 
But on her way out of town, Aunt B, ever causing trouble, stops by the gas station and asks Goober, keep an eye on Andy, make sure he doesn't get lonely while I'm away. To which Goober enthusiastically agrees. Andy, excited about his time as a bachelor at home alone, picks up a few unusual foods at the grocery store and begins to think about all the stuff he's going to get to do, the TV shows he's going to get to watch, the food he's going to get to eat, leaving his shoes in the middle of the floor when he gets home from work, goes to the grocery store where he runs into good old Howard. And he explains that being alone has granted him the freedom to do things he wouldn't ordinarily do. So soon after he gets home, Goober arrives. Good old Goober. Goober arrives, and although Andy tries to drive him away, he cannot, and so goes to the office to be alone. And later that evening, Andy and Goober sit down to dinner eating Goober's favorite meal, spaghetti, made with a secret ingredient, oregano. Upon finishing, Goober suddenly remembers some calls that Andy received while he was out, and he attempts to give him the messages, Howard calling to invite him to dinner, and Helen calling about the upcoming Young People's Club meeting, and Although he's already eaten one meal of spaghetti, Andy feels obligated to show up at Howard's house for dinner despite being full. You can see where this is going. So Andy shows up at Howard's house just as he and his mother have finished washing the dishes and confused by his arrival, but not willing to turn him away, Howard and his mother decide they're going to put some leftovers on the table to feed this man that has showed up at their house, unbeknownst to them. And what do you think they had left over? Spaghetti. But this time, it is an old family recipe with a secret ingredient. Oregano. Andy reluctantly sits down to eat his second dinner. Returning home, annoyed that Goober... For his carelessness, he decides, I'm going to bed. I think we'd all go to bed after two dinners of spaghetti. But as he goes to walk up the stairs, Helen angrily calls. She had invited him to dinner, and he is now an hour late. And so Goober, realizing his mistake too late, Helen insists that Andy get over to her house, and Andy, angry at Goober, complies. He arrives at Helen's house, yet another meal of spaghetti. This time made from a recipe that has been forced out of a famous New York chef with some new Greek spice called oregano. Meanwhile, Opie's camping trip gets canceled and he shows up at Helen's house to eat a dinner where he guilt trips Andy into finishing his third meal of spaghetti. Next day when Andy arrives, when Aunt B arrives, she says, you don't look like you've eaten enough. Let me put something together. Hamburger, wait, no, spaghetti. That'll be quick. The truth of the matter is, is I don't care how much you like any particular food, four times in an evening is too much. Why? Because to the full soul, it loathes the honeycomb. It loathes the thing that you like the most. If you're full, you're full. You don't want no more. Brother Art has no clue what I'm talking about. Bottomless pit. Never full. My daughter Emily doesn't know what being full means. Could be pouring out of her ears and she still would not be full. But the Bible, according to 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 Solomon's, uh, Solomon's wisdom, shows that in some respects, the poor have an advantage over the rich. They get more pleasure and enjoyment out of their little than the rich out of their plenty. Because hungry is the secret sauce. 
It might just be plain food to the wealthy whose belly is full of delights and dainties, but to the hungry soul, it looks on the plainest morsels with relish and it becomes a delicacy. Has anybody here ever had cornbread and buttermilk? How about collard greens and gizzards? What about biscuits and gravy? Somebody just got the Holy Ghost out there. Amen. How about fried okra and fried green tomatoes? Mm, we're about to have Holy Ghost plow pour tonight. Turnips and rutabaga. Ain't nothing smells worse than a cooked rutabaga. I'd rather run, up, I'd rather run over a buzzard eating a dead skunk than I would smell a rutabaga. I would knock a buzzard off a, uh, off a gut wagon. I'm telling you, my great-grandmother used to cook rutabagas. I would not go in the house. But to the hungry soul, if you're hungry enough, you'll pull up a turnip. People used to think that potatoes were of the devil until people in Ireland decided there ain't nothing else to eat but the potato. And now you have a generation of people who are known only for one thing, potatoes. Aren't you glad that somebody decided to pull up the potato? Where would we be without scalloped potatoes? Where would we be without baked potatoes? Where would we be without french fries? What about corned beef and cabbage? These are not the things that the well-to-do eat. They eat things like duck confit. Confit means it was cooked in its own fat, by the way. They, they eat things like ribeye. They don't have corned beef and cabbage, but they, and, and, and they don't have tomato sandwiches. Ooh, I want a tomato sandwich right now. I mean, Brother, Brother Weiniger came here last week, started cook, talking about his cast iron skillet and taters and onions and squash and potato, all, all these things that, that I've talked about are southern poor people's staples. And it may not seem much to somebody in Washington, D.C. who's used to caviar and champagne and driving along in limousines and flying in big jets. It may not seem much to them, but for the poor folk that live in the mill village, grit, how many grits is good? And fried catfish that you caught yourself is good. And biscuits and gravy are filling. And corned beef and cabbage is healthy for you. And fried okra is good. And sautéed squash is good. Because to the hungry soul, everything is good. If it fills your belly and takes away the hunger, it doesn't matter if it's fancy. It doesn't matter if it's got sugar or if a chef cooked it for you. If it's filling your belly, it's good for you. It's not the foods of the wealthy, but of the poor. Put the poor man's belly's full even when the minions tomato sandwiches and chicken feet. The poor man's hunger satiated even when the meal's grits and salt pork. To the hungry soul, anything on the table is satisfying regardless of what somebody else thinks about it. I don't need the dainties of the world. I don't need the things that the world's got to offer. I just need whatever God's going to put on the table. I need whatever God is willing to put in my belly. God, here I am. Feel me. I'm hungry, not for the dainties of the world. I don't care about new cars. I don't care about new suits. It doesn't matter if we've got a new bus. It doesn't matter if you got a fancy building. It doesn't matter if you got a lit up sign. If you've got the gospel and if you got the God that's, oh, somebody help me. You got everything you need. Those who eat sumptuously every day are nauseated with the delicate food and can be turned away from the table. But as we learn from the New Testament, a man named Lazarus, while the beggar will sit at the gate 
while, the, while, while the, the wealthy man will be turned away from his dainties, the beggar will sit at the gate on the chance of catching the morsels that fall from the table. Coarse fare with good appetite attached to it has pleasantness, pleasantness that a full belly can never understand. If the world won't satisfy your hunger, it could, if the word of God rather won't satisfy your hunger, it could be today that you're too full of the world. But if you're truly hungry for the things of God, he will supply your every need. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the problem that we have in the Western world is we got too much stuff. Maybe the problem we've got is we our air conditioning is too good because if the temperature's not right, nobody want to help me tonight. Maybe the problem is, maybe the problem is if the music is not the kind that I like. If we got young people that can't shout to page two. They got old folks that can't shout to anything written after 1995. If it don't sound like Vestal, let me tell you, if it's got a Jerusalem ring, I don't care what's, what year it came from, whether it's played with a banjo or a screaming electric guitar, if it glorifies God, there's got to be something on the inside of us, whether we're young or old, that says, I'm in the house of God. These are the songs of Zion. This is the worship of the one true God. I'm not going to get so careless that I come in and turn away from the table. If I'm singing, oh, I want to see him, I'm going to shout. If I'm singing something that came out last year, I'm going to shout. Why? Because I'm hungry for the move of God. Have we become so careless? Have we become so jaded? Oh, if it's pastor, I won't shout. But if it's the evangelist, I'm going to shout. No, it's the word of God. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. Whether it's a 12-year-old or somebody that's preaching for 100 years, it's still the word of God. And it's still profitable for you. It's still profitable for correction. It's still profitable for instruction in righteousness. It's still profitable to edify the body of Christ. Whether I come at midweek or I come to camp meeting, it's still the word of God. Whether it's a mass choir or five people in a praise team, it's still the songs of Zion. I, I don't want to get so careless that I push away the things God is trying to feed me with. Jesus in Luke 4. He said, it's written. Maybe that's where we should start when the devil comes to us. If it's good enough for Jesus, maybe that's where we ought to start when temptation. When the temptation comes, I ain't going to church tonight. You say, it is written. Forsake not the assembling yourselves together as a matter of some now is. And so much more as you see the day approaching. And then you get in the car and put it in drive and park yourself in a pew and worship God. Oh, maybe we ought to start when we get tempted. Oh, I may, I ain't going to pay my, I'm not going to do my missions commitment this month. Maybe that, maybe that temptation comes. Well, I don't know if I really want to do that. Maybe we ought to say, it is written. Don't rob me of tithe and offering. Oh, that temptation comes. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna crop this. I'm gonna pierce this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stamp this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a little sun on my legs, brother Art. That temptation comes. Well, why don't you start? With, it is written. Be holy, <laughs> for I, the Lord your God, am holy. I wonder if there's anybody tonight that'll get that in your spirit, just like Jesus, and start saying it's written. When a temptation comes or the adversary comes, it is 
written. Oh, man shall not live by my bread alone, but by every word of God. the message here. What's what's Jesus getting across? It's not all in the natural. You can have all the emotion you want. You can have all all, all the atmosphere you want. As a matter of fact, today, the nominal nominal world wants so much what we have on this Pentecost Sunday that they'll manufacture it with their atmosphere. Anybody know what a mantra is? No? It's repeating the same line over and over and over again to get you to a spiritual dimension. It's what they do in, in Eastern mysticism and in, in Hindu and a lot of these other, other, other Eastern religions. They say mantras. They, they have prayer beads. It's interestingly enough, in Catholicism and Islam and in, in, in the Hindu religion, they all use prayer beads. They're mantras. You say the same prayer over and over again. What did Jesus say about that? Don't use vain repetition as the heathen do. Right? Are we all right? We're still okay? Y'all didn't didn't leave me? Okay. We have, we create an atmosphere, create this, this, this atmosphere in churches where we want you to feel something for your flesh so that you feel leaving better than you came in. But the most important part of the service gets left out. When somebody gets behind the pulpit and begins to preach what thus saith the word of God. Not what thus saith Facebook. Not what thus saith Twitter. Not what thus saith Fox News. But what thus saith the word of God. Of God, you can't live on your flesh. You can't live on feelings. You've got to have something. David said, thy word. Not the songs. Not the music. He said, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. You can't live on, on, on flesh and alone. You can't live on bread. You can't live on blessing. You can't make it on provision. you got to have the word of God. And if you're hungry for it, God will fill you with whatever you need. People ask Psalm 105, people asked and he brought quails and satisfied with the bread of heaven he opened the rock and the waters gushed out and they ran in the dry places like a river why Deuteronomy 8 tells us so that you I might make thee to know that man doth not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live by You see, God has many ways to provide for his people with or without ordinary means. There's a movement, I get it, things could go south, but there's a movement and everybody's prepping. Y'all heard of preppers? Just like super couponers, they got their own TV show, right? Prepping, bug out bags. Ain't nothing wrong with being prepared. If you're a Boy Scout, that's all right. You ought to know how to tie knots and fish, trap a rabbit if you need to. But preppers, preparing for everything to go south, stocked up on gold and silver, rice and beans, peanut butter, because apparently it doesn't go bad. Stocked up on everything. Stocked up on ammunition and guns. And we got Christians that are doing the same thing today. But let me me just lay it on the line with you today. If things really do get bad, and I do believe they're going to get bad, I believe there's going to be some persecution that we're going to have to go through. If God, all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Exodus, can take a people who don't have any self-government, who don't know how to sling a sword, who don't know anything about ruling themselves, put them out in the wilderness, 
and feed millions of them with manna and quail and bring forth water out of a rock? Do you not think that in 2022, if the economy fails and there's no baby formula and there's a wheat shortage, that your God could not rain down manna in the backyard? Come on, is there anybody tonight that knows that we don't live by bread alone, but we're standing on the word? He said, and my God shall provide all your need according to his riches and glory. God wanted to teach Israel the importance of trusting him more than they trusted themselves. To trust his ability to provide more than they trusted in the land's ability to provide for them. And so when the people of Israel murmured and demanded to Moses, take us back to Egypt, God showed them that he could provide every need in the wilderness. The full soul will leave the blessing of freedom to go back to Egypt for the leeks and the melons, but the hungry soul says, I want to be free. God, I'll take whatever you send me today. If you send me manna, I'll eat it. If you send me quail, I'll eat it. I'm just glad to be free. And so Jesus said, don't use vain repetitions. Don't pray like the heathen pray. He said, don't, don't be like those heathen folk that, that pray the prayers that way. But when he began, he said, I'll teach you how to pray. And in that prayer, he said, give us this day our daily. Come on, is there anybody today that trusts God for today? I'm not telling you to not put in a Walmart order for tomorrow, but is there anybody here tonight that trusts God that if things go south, God's going to take care of me? If corn's got to sprout up in the backyard, if wheat's got to start growing in the back 40, I believe that God will provide. So give us this day our daily bread. Why? Because he knows what you need for today. When you open up your Bible study and you begin to read the Bible, he knows what you need for today. When you show up to midweek service, well, that's just Wednesday night. I don't know about you, but by Wednesday, I'm hungry. Show up on Sunday morning, show up on Sunday night, week after week, God knows what you need. He knows what you need to hear, Sister Vicki. He knows the word of God you need for the day. He knows the word of God you need to get you through this day of work. He knows the voice that you need to hear to get you through your trouble. And I don't want to ever get to a place where I get so full of myself out in the world that I'm not hungry in the morning to hear what thus saith the Lord. God knows what you need, but you got to go out and get it. Two things, Proverbs 30 and 7 said, two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food. Convenient for me. God, if, it, if you got filet mignon on the menu... Somebody say filet mignon, praise God. You got, you got ribs and baked beans and cornbread and slaw, praise God. But if it's corned beef and cabbage, Lord, let it fill my belly to the overflowing. Come on, if it's Edward's pie and ice cream, praise God. But if it's prunes and, and dry tack or, or hard tack and prunes, oh, praise God for it. It fills the belly, amen? Feed me with whatever you want me to have. Some I lost a couple of you there. Why? Lest I be full and deny you. Yeah. 
So one of the problems I see today is we got folks that got too full. Replacement theory. Right? Because I was broke and walked with God, but when God started blessing me, I stopped walking with Him and I started walking with mammon. And the Bible said you can't serve both. Because you'll love the one and hate the other. You'll cling to the one and you'll despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. you got to serve one or the other. What, what, what is the prayer tonight that we see in Proverbs? Don't make me rich or poor, Lord. Don't make me to a place where I'll get so full that I'll deny you. But keep me hungry. Keep me in a place where you can continue to provide. Keep me in a place where I can still need you. Jesus, Jesus gave a tough saying in John chapter number 6. Verse 32 said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. That's not the hard part. The tough part came when he said, unless you partake of my flesh and of my blood, you have no part. You see, that was against the law. You don't eat the meat with the blood in it. Speaking to all these Jews, that, that's a hard saying. And the Bible said that many left him that day. And he turned to the other disciples and he said, will you also go away? And he said, where are we going to go to? Where, where will we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. But why, why was the saying so hard? Because they were thinking in the flesh. Spiritually, what Jesus is teaching them is you have to become one with me. What you consume, let me, let me bring it down to it. You are what you eat. You eat ham hocks and fat back. What are you going to have? You're going to have ham ox and a fat back. Amen. You are what you eat. We had an interesting conversation about soy earlier today. We won't go into that tonight. But you become what you consume. What you put into your body will either help you to be healthy or the other way. Jesus was getting at here, it is unless you take me in and become a partaker and partake what I am about, you won't have any part with me. And so here are three principles. First, you have to have an appetite for Christ. I appreciate that. Feel like I just hit a good golf shot. Said you've got to have an appetite for Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You've got to have an appetite for the things of God. The world is full of people who are filling themselves with the world. And they're so full of the dainties of this world that it has to offer that they've left off seeking God. And while incomes and prosperity grow, church attendance is steadily declining. But there is a people that will say, God, I'm still hungry 
Regardless of how blessed I am, regardless of what brand of clothes I wear, I'm hungry for a move of the Holy Ghost. Come on, is this still the church of the book of Acts? The day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost didn't happen in a cathedral or at the temple. It happened in a borrowed room. The Azusa Street Revival over a hundred years ago took place in an old shop or an old barn, an old rented room. Apostolic Revival happened in brush arbors, in storefronts, and under trees, and on front porches, and in people's houses, and in their parlors, and on the back porches. Is there anybody hearing me tonight? If you've got a hunger for God, we can have apostolic revival. It doesn't matter what church, what, what building you've got. If you got a big bus, if you got a fancy sign, if you got fancy clothes, all you need is the presence and power of God. Hunger. I don't know what time. I don't know what time I started. So, well, what's the difference? What's the difference here today? What's the difference in America today and overseas right now? It's hunger. Who needs miracles when I can go to the doctor and get a prescription filled? Who needs a prayer line when I just go get surgery? Well, because I'd rather get prayed for than go under. Oh, who needs the preacher to lay hands on him but I could just go in and take 800 milligrams of ibuprofen and let the headache go away? I, I, I am sick to tears of standing up and saying, oh, I've got this sickness in my body, I pray for me. No, the Bible said if you're, there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them anoint their head with oil and pray the prayer of faith and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Is there anybody that's sick? Come and get prayer. That's what the book of Acts is all about. That's what the church is all about. Are you hungry for the things of God? So hunger, hunger after the things of God. Next thing you got to have is a, you got to apply it. I almost brought a cookbook up here. Maybe I could have brought my Paula Dean cookbook up here. Y'all. Spread some mayonnaise on it. That woman, you could put mayonnaise on flip flops. You think it's good? I could have brought my Robert Irvine cookbook or my Emerald Lagasse cookbook. I don't actually cook any of these things. It's just cool to have a cookbook. Or my my first cookbook. Somebody brought us a my first cookbook when we got married. We still have that my first cookbook. Teach you how to cook things like pot roast, how to boil water. Boil an egg. You can live a long time. You just learn how to boil an egg. If you're Bob Shanks, if you throw some ramen noodles in there, you got a meal. Amen? You can hold that cookbook up all day long. It ain't going to fill you up. You, you can go to Chili's and Applebee's and Longhorn, and you can look at the menu until you pass out. But you're going to pass out from sugar issues if you don't eat something. I don't care how, look, how long you look at it. It's not getting in there by osmosis. What do you got to do, Brother Frank? You got to pluck the chicken. You got to take out the innards. Some of you eat the innards. You got to clean it out. You got to put butter and salt and pepper and herbs and spoon. Oh, man. Then you got to pop that baby in the oven at 350 for two hours. Take the drippings and put him on some cornbread. Ain't nobody here saved? What's wrong with y'all? What does it take? Some action. You got to get the groceries and turn groceries into supper. 
You can stare at the refrigerator all night long and it ain't going to fill your heart's desire. You got to what? You got to eat it. I ain't helping nobody here tonight. James 1.21 said, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness in superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Amen. We all shouted that. Praise God. Let's go eat. Verse 22 says what? But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Now the word is not just holiness. The word is not just paying your tithes. Help me, Maddie. Come on, give me an amen or something. The word is not just how long your britches are and how long your hair is. All those things are important, but guess what else is in the word? Lay hands on the sick. Cast out devils. Pray the prayer of faith. Is it just me or speaking in tongues still the word? Is it just me or is being baptized in the name of Jesus still the word? Is repentance still the word? Is holy living still the word? But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. It doesn't matter how much preaching you hear. If you don't take it home and do it, we can talk about speaking in tongues. But until they did it, they never got filled. Oh, I'm here to tell somebody, you need to start practicing what you preach. If you're hungry for God, lay hands on the sick and pray. If you're hungry for God, pray till you pray through. If you're hungry for God, do the word. Reading about it's not good enough. I've got to experience it. Children of Israel could have looked at that manna. What is it? Levi, what is it? It looks like a wafer. It's the color of coriander. What is it? You can look at it all day long. The Bible said that they went out and the quail was, a, was about a mile out on each side of the camp and it was stacked up about this deep. Well, if you leave it out there, it's going to stink. What do you got to do with it? You got to go get it. And if you don't get it, it'll spoil by the next morning. When God gives us a word and God speaks something to us, we can't just leave it sitting out there to rot. We got to do something with it. I know there's practical value. There's practical value in the Bible. The world would be a whole lot better place even if sinners would obey some of the Bible. The golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Wow, that'd stop wars. That'd help you get a better parking spot at Walmart. There'd be no road rage. Nobody would slash your tires. No, no ugly emails. No nasty grams on Facebook. If you just do unto others as you have them doing to you. So there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of good practical wisdom and practical value in the Scripture. But the goal of God's Word is not to make you a better businessman or a more likable person in the world. What is the goal of God's Word? 2 Timothy 3 and 10 says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine... Manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution." But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And listen, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, 
which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith uh, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto good works. The word of God is help made to bring us to salvation. It's not enough to look at the menu. We've got to partake of it and apply it to our lives and it may not f- fulfill and satisfy the hunger of somebody that's got everything they want but for those of us today that are hungry give me the word give me some beans and rice give me some basics just give me the word of God last point I didn't even read a poem. Three points in a poem. That makes a good sermon, right? The last thing is about Jesus. It's from him that we get our nourishment. You see, I, th- I, think, I think the American way is the pull yourself up by your bootstraps and be self, uh, self-sufficient. And I think that you ought to be self-sufficient. You need to learn how to wash your own clothes. Mm Mm-hmm, looking at you. You need to know how to grow your own vegetables. Catch your own fish. Give a man a fish. He eats for a day. Teach a man how to fish. He breaks the law. Excuse me, he eats for the rest of his life. You need to learn to be self-sufficient. Change your own tire, brethren. No, that's what your husband's for. Fill your gas tank when you run it on dry on the highway in Macon. I didn't say that. Don't tell my wife I said that. She'll get on me. You need to be self-sufficient with things. I agree. However, I think part of the problem that we have is that we think that we don't need anybody. Need. I don't need anybody. The Bible Paul, he said, he said, it's in him that we live and we move and we have our being. Do you understand today that when the Bible said that God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, the body was there. But until God gave it a breath, a ruach, Till he breathed into it, it was dead. And it doesn't matter how long you're on a ventilator or on machines. If God takes the breath, there's no coming back. He gives us all life. We live in him. It's in him that we live and move and have our being. We need him. It doesn't matter how green a thumb that you have. Without God, it will not bring forth increase. What did the writer say? One man soweth, one man watereth, and God giveth the increase. He's speaking spiritually about soul winning, but it works in the natural as well. If God wills that the carrots don't grow, guess what you don't get? Carrot cake. You need... God and our nourishment spiritually must come from him. In the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 8, the people of Israel have been taken into captivity. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I want you to grab some of the chief, the elect, the best looking young men that you can find out of the rulers of Israel. And I want you to train them certain time in our ways. He gave them new names, change their names. I want you to integrate them into our culture. Feed them with the king's meats. Feed them with the things that we eat. But the Bible said Daniel purposed in his heart 
that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Why? Because it was offered to idols. It was unclean. It was against the law. And Daniel said, I will not eat that stuff. I will not partake of the things that God said are not good for me. Even if I'm in captivity, even if that's all there is, I will not allow that into my life. And so he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. The prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children of our, our, your own sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. But this is what happens when you trust God. Daniel said to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servants, I beseech you ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. And what happened? He consented to them in this matter, and he proved them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. God, give me what you want me to have. I don't need the king's dainties. I don't need the world's morsels. I don't need what the world's got to offer. I don't need to integrate the world into the church. Just give me Jesus. Give me that old time religion. Give me prayer. Give me worship. Give me the preaching. Give me an altar call. Give me the songs of Zion. Give me what worked way back then. That's all I need. I don't want to defile myself with the things of the world. They may fill and they may make you, but they'll fill you to a place where you won't want truth. Where you want, why, why do we have such a problem today? Because we filled churches with the things of the world so much that they don't want the genuine move of God anymore. It's enough just to satisfy the flesh, but for the hungry soul, but for the one that's hungry, the one that says, I want truth, the one that says, I want God, I want presence and not atmosphere, that one will be satisfied in his soul. Eating but never satisfied. A full soul loatheth the honeycomb. There's not much better tasting in the world than honey. Fresh honey. Local honey. Not much better in the world. much better I think that you could ever eat. There's nothing quite so sweet and good and healthy for you than honey. But the full soul that fills itself with the world will look at the sweetest thing and not desire it. But the soul that's hungry will take every bitter thing. There's some bitter things that you have to swallow. Bitter trials that you've got to go through. Bitter things that we have to face. It's not always easy. In the world, you'll have tribulations. Paul said, if you're going to live this way, you're going to have persecution. Probably going to be broke. 
You might get shipwrecked. You're going to lose friends. Family's not going to want to hang out with you anymore. A lot have left this way because they wanted to be full. But your Bible tells you that the hungry soul sees every bitter thing as sweet. Why? Because we esteem the reproach. We, we look at the things that we face and we attach to it a value in the eternal that everything we face, it's worth it. And that God is able to fill us with something more satisfying. To fill us with something that will truly satisfy hunger. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled like I said I wish you had a better preacher tonight this music comes the psalmist David said in the 107th division he said they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go into a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul. And filleth the hungry soul with goodness. If you're hungry, the answer is not out there. Why is there a move of God in the world today? Why are people being baptized in Jesus' name at a clip like we've never seen? Why are more people being baptized with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues than ever before? Because in this hour, this latter day reign, the Spirit of God's being poured out on a generation that's hungry, that's fed up, sick of religion, sick of formality, sick of tradition, sick of the world, sick of all the things that it's got to fulfill them with that will never satisfy their hungry, but they're hungry for truth. They're sick of their religion. They're sick of all the, the rules and the things that have been forced upon them. And they're hungry for the love of God. They're hungry for the truth. They're hungry to feel something that's genuine. And the Bible said, if you will hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. Is there anybody hungry? Are you hungry for old time religion? Are you hungry for the church to be filled? Are you hungry to see sicknesses healed? Is there anybody that's hungry? Oh, worship the Lord here tonight. We need a move of God. We need a move of God. We need a move of God. Come on, worship Him. Are you hungry for the Holy Ghost? How far are you willing to go? How deep are you willing to go? How long are you willing to pray? What are you willing to do to get the thing that satisfies to the soul? I'm hungry for you, Lord. Why don't you lift your hands and worship Him? Cry out to Jesus tonight. He satisfies the hungry soul.
know we really don't see a lot of this in our country. It's in some places, of course, some cities, of course, but we really don't see an awful lot of people begging for food. I know there are those that do it because they don't want to work, and we understand all that. But there probably has been some time in your life that every one of us has seen someone that was truly in need, asking for help. You have to wonder, at least, what would possess someone to do that? What would possess someone to hang their pride up on a hook and stand out there and ask for whatever somebody might be willing to give them? It didn't just happen because that was just the thing they thought to do. It happened because they were desperate. Because they had exhausted everything else. Because there was no job that would hire them. and There was no family member they could go to that would help them. There was was nowhere else to turn. And so they just turned on the mercy of strangers. They, They were desperate for anything. I wonder what it will take for the church really to bombard heaven to see the things that if we're perfectly honest we're not seeing and experience the things that we really are not experiencing they're going to take place when the church gets desperate for a move of God not because We've got bills to pay, not because we're sick and we need healing, but because we want to see God in all of His power and all of His glory, and we're fed up and we're sick and tired of ordinary church and empty pews and lost families in a world that's looking for answers, and we know we've got the only one. We need to get desperate. We need to get hungry for a move of God. Because a move of God will change this world. Nothing else will. Amen. God bless you tonight for being faithful to the house of the Lord. Be in prayer for your brothers and sisters who are in need. That the Lord would just bless them, lift them up, uh, give them a call or a text tomorrow, encourage them. Amen. Just do the work of God's kingdom. Man, tell somebody about Jesus if tomorrow comes. Maybe even tonight if you encounter him, tell somebody about the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.